Serbruani, Dr. Victor, uh, these guys, yes, doctors. So uh, Dr. Victor is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins University and uh, the owner of Heart Drug uh, Research Center. And he's uh, associate editor, uh, thrombocardiology at uh, Carger. So uh, join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Victor. And uh, he's going to present a lecture about focused update on dual antiplatelet therapy. So uh, welcome, Dr. Victor. And the floor is yours. Thank you, my friend. I want to thank uh, uh, your company for inviting me. I'm not very often guest doing these things, and you will understand why after this lecture. Uh, to make it sure, please, uh, next slide. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh-oh. Uh-huh. Uh, the reason why this lecture will be somewhat specific and kind of uh, different from the others is because I will share with you this uh, outlook from the FDA, <clears throat> where I have a privilege to check on antiplatelet trials from 2004 till 2012, ending up with a PLATA trial and Ticagrelor. And therefore, you know, I'm sort of insider uh, knowing how the things are doing, how the things are done, what people are thinking about many other things, and what they really are concerned uh, with regard to non-public evidence. And therefore, I hope you will guys have some fun here at the end of your busy Friday. Next slide, please. So we will discuss strategies, which are mostly wrong, unfortunately, uh, impact of antiplatelet therapy potency and cancer efficacy, bleeding and compliance, and then we'll end up with few thoughts about all these issues. Next, please. So that is a very straightforward statement uh, from uh, Mr. Clausewitz, regarding the strategies, and if they fail, you cannot repair them by any tactical victories. In other words, if the dose of antiplatelet drug is way too high, as it happened in Triton trial with Prazogrel, then you can do whatever you want. You can uh, play the game. You can uh, say that, you know what, in uh, ladies with blue eyes, in diabetics, the drug is great here, the drug is very good there. But in reality, the drug will fail despite all the efforts to repair it and to do something really good with it. Next one. So if we look at the strategies, um, you know, that's very simple. You think that uh, you know, show us the CV reduction of events. This is how the FDA officials start every pre-trial negotiations with the industry or any big trial which is ongoing. And they will deal with the bleeding later. That I heard that probably three or four times in the major trials. Didn't work this way. The problem is that somebody else will die, but you specifically, you, the patient, will experience the bleed. And that is very critical. The other thing is related to the net clinical benefit. That is a very tricky issue which we play left and right, and not only in antiplatelet world, but in reality, the marketing strategies probably kind of dangerous and wrong again because the patient don't think it this way. He thinks, hey, I'm having the bleeding. That's my net clinical benefit. The chance that I didn't die, that's irrelevant for me. I do not believe in that. The chance for me to bleed and to bleed repeatedly and massively, that is the one that worries me most. And that's why <clears throat> the issue of compliance will go on this and that. So, uh, 
And then you promote the trade-off, which is a wrong thing too. When you say, hey, you know, you have a less chance to die, you should experience bleeding, and you should have a bleed uh, just in case. Uh, not working this way too, and we will discuss it a little bit later why it is not so. And then, you know, financial issues are here too, and uh, the antiplatelet trials and development and marketing of antiplatelet agents are billions of dollars, and uh, there is no support for the shareholders after the Plavix era, which is still selling over the billion dollars a year in the world. It's amazing. We have all the recommendations say that we should use Ticagrel or Prazogrel, and uh, there are zillion generic uh, clopidogrels, but Plavix is still selling over the billion dollars. Think about it. That is very interesting thing. So also, um, there is absolutely dictatorial trial design, at least in the antiplatelet world. <clears throat> if you excuse me, <clears throat> if you look at the uh, trials, there are about one and a half men in the world who actually design the trials, and companies use, usually viciously fight against any changes in how they try to design the trial. And in many cases, the placebo arm is heavily under armored, just to make sure that the benefit of the drug per se is way, way stronger than it should be in real life. Next slide, please. So what are the major success uh, issues here? That is a publication in the major journals like New England Journal of Medicine, where uh, your favorite Jupiter trial was and all the main trials are published. But what is happening with open access these days today is a disaster, meaning the value of a quality publication diminish remarkably. And basically, you can publish whatever you want and be in Medline and PubMed and, you know, just pay a couple dollars and be there. And it's a very sad situation with the publishing and open access. And all of us know precisely that. That's an issue here. The other thing is like talks. Uh, there are very few professional nice talks as we have today with our uh, speakers from Germany and Italy, you know, like friendly, normal, uh, balanced talks. The, in the meetings, about 75% of the talks are related to the heavily marketing efforts uh, basically paid by the industry this way or the other. And the value of these talks is uh, astonishingly low. We all see when the uh, this famous professor will go to one room, speak on one drug, then run away to the other room, and then speak on the other drug. And, uh, you know, the value of these talks is um, very, very limited. Also, we need to say that... Uh, um, <clears throat> talking about the uh, advisor boards and all these kickbacks which people are having around it. The value of it is very limited as well uh, because the physicians, the prescribing physicians are becoming more and more skeptical with regard to what they're hearing this way or the other. And knowing the FDA documents from inside and seeing what's happening in reality, <clears throat> from inside make you even more skeptical and kind of very, very strange things are happening and we'll talk about it later. Next slide, please. So that is the bottom line, a cornerstone slide showing Kaplan-Meier curves of efficacy of the primary endpoint and the Triton trial, which was designed <clears throat> to beat clopidogrel. If you look at these two pictures, picture A shows you what is published in, of course, New England Journal of Medicine and what was submitted to the FDA and what we look at within the medical reviewer's team. The B portion here is the one which is happening in reality. 
The problem is that there was a front-loaded immediate benefit of Prazogrel because the dose of uh, clopidogrel loading was low and the patients were severe and they were all going on through interventions. And look, look at the difference. The growing benefit on A and no benefit at all after the front loading on B. Why is this difference happening? When the trial was finished, the sponsor of the trial get to the FDA and change the definition of myocardial infarction after the trial. And therefore, they pick up all the enzymatic bombs, all the events which were not first qualified as a MI, and put it and made the A situation, when in reality, it is a B situation. It is like we will be playing uh, soccer with you, football, and my gates will be two meters and your gates will be four meters. This is exactly how the thing works. Next slide, please. This is a PLATA trial. By the way, the person who designed and was behind the PLATA trial is exactly the same person who was in charge of Jupiter trial. Look. Do you really see any benefit of uh, Ticagrel early on in the patients who underwent interventions, which is now 99% of where the drug is actually uh, utilized? Look, Glyvix is actually early better than Ticagrel. And you are talking about potent antiplatelet agent, and you are talking about recommendations of United States and Europe. Here is what it is in reality happening. And this is internal FDA documents created by top FDA reviewers. Next slide. If you look at the data and you look at all cause and cardiovascular mortality, there is really something going on with the PCI patients. And early death benefit is absolutely lacking in the ticagrel arm of this major fundamental trial. Next slide, please. These are the same dose of clopidogrel, which is 75 milligram daily, and uh, prazogrel or ticagrel or with regard to the STEMI death, which way more important than all this made up enzymatic bombs, which they claim to be myocardial infarctions. Look at the difference. <clears throat> same Plavix, same difference, immediate front-loading benefit on Prazogrel, and later on, the reduction of the death benefit for one particular reason we're going to be discussing later, which is cancer, which is death from solid cancer in the end of this trial. And look at Plata, look at Plata, which you have all these patients around you, why the benefit is growing, why the benefit is growing over time, which never happened with any antiplatelet agent. And look at the clopidogrel death, 4.3% of clopidogrel death in Triton and 6.1% in, uh, you know, same design, same type of follow-up length, uh, Plata trial, why is that happening like that? Look at Prazogrel death versus Ticagrel death. Why we are telling that Ticagrel is a drug which saves lives, which is having a mortality benefit. Just look at it. It's like you don't need to be a rocket scientist here. That's a simple kind of straightforward uh, message sending us here. Next slide, please. These are the outcomes of the biggest country which was not monitored by the sponsor, which is the United States, which have 1,413 patients. And it was a CRO monitoring the uh, patients and the outcomes and everything in the database. Uh, look, there is a heavy benefit late on of Plavix versus Ticagrelor. Did you ever see this uh, slide in the promotional 
take agro law, you know, talks? Probably no. Why is that? Why late in the trial, the patients on clopidogrel show more benefit than early on and over take agro law? And that was the only big piece of evidence which was not controlled by the sponsor. So as Russia, so as Georgia, and so as part of Ukraine. And everywhere in these places, take agrola benefit was not existing. Opposite. More importantly, the benefit was consistent with regard to all three components of the primary endpoint, which was vascular death, including bleeding in this trial, myocardial infarction and stroke. All three of them show benefit of Plavix versus Brillinta. Next slide. There was a very dangerous thing which we found in the Triton trial. Therefore, we start looking how antiplatelet agents actually uh, impact cancer long term. And Capri was kind of a neutral. There was no uh, extra risk of clopidogrel over uh, aspirin with regard to bleeding and uh, cancer. Next slide. Next, please. This is what happened in Triton. There was four months grace period and then babach there was way more growing impact of very heavy antiplatelet therapy with regard to cancer risks and cancer rates. Look how this, you know, uh, lines triage immediately after four months, and it is a really significant increase of solid cancers after prazogrel 10 milligram daily, as used excessively in the Triton trial. Next slide. This is what happened in women in Triton. You don't even need four months, considering that ladies have different pharmacokinetics and they have uh, different, uh, you know, body weight, especially those who are, who are underweight ladies, elderly ladies. Look, there is a massive increase in solid cancers with regard to prazogrel treatment. Do you ever see anything like that? in the, you know, files or lectures done by Eli Lili or Sankyo with regard to uh, Prazogrel, Effiant? I doubt it. Next slide. If you take major big antiplatelet trials, there is a straightforward signal that the more potent antiplatelet strategy you choose, the more cancer you're going to see, dot, period. Next slide. That is very interesting drug, and there are two issues with this drug. The drug name is Zontiviti of Rapaxar. The sponsor at that time, Merck, stopped developing the drug in the middle of the trial. Therefore, there was no manipulation or how the FDA say massaging of the data. That is really what happened. And a look at Tracer, there was Tracer and TRAD2P. Two trials and look, there are solid cancers going on against more potent antiplatelet strategy. Next slide. If you think that it is related to antiplatelet agents, uh, we both are wrong because it is related to uh, various trials with uh, new anticoagulants. This is happening with a praise trial. Look at the Pixaban. Next one. These are solid cancer locations in a praise trial. Uh, this way or the other, uh, there are more than double cases of solid cancer over the follow-up in uh, this trial. Next slide. This is what happened with the Bigatran, and importantly, the higher the dose, the more risks for cancer are there. Next trial. 
So where we are with regard to cancer, antiplatelet and anticoagulants have a linear reaction with regard to cancer risks. The more potent therapy you apply, the more risks of, of cancer are. And this is compared to our target today's low-dose aspirin, which is probably doing something not bad with colon cancer. Let's put it very accurately. Next one. So this is what the FDA reviewers actually think. And I think they're exactly right. And we published a couple things about it. So basically, this is what it is. If you are having cancer cells generated in your body for every day, and this is true, these cancer cells are there, but they are targeted by platelets and they are kept in situ so uh, macrophages and lymphocytes can fight and kill them. If you have a chronic, way too potent platelet inhibition, you will get these cancer cells start circulating over and over again. And inability of platelets, because they are totally unworking, to keep them in situ, to keep them in sight, cause, you know, metastasis, cause generation of very aggressive uh, very early cell cancers, which kill people in weeks. We see about a dozen of such patients, and we have reports over in the FIRES FDA database about these patients on uh, prazogrel and ticagrelor and few anticoagulants, meaning those cancers are done by very specific blast cells not clear where is the origin of the cells is, and the patients die very fast. Next one. So the other uh, myth we are talking about is that there is a sweet spot or some sort of a comfort zone for optimal antithrombotic management. This is related to anticoagulants and antiplatelets as well. Next one. We all see this funny picture, which have nothing to do with reality. Because patients care about the bleeding. They have it today. There is a chance for non-compliance. There is a chance for being upset, changing the doctor. This is exactly what our Italian uh, professor was telling us. Like the moment you bleed on antiplatelet agent, most likely you will stop taking all of the, all, all of such medications or change the doctor. Next one. This is another very important thing related to trial 2P. Why this trial is very important? Again, two reasons. A, they got an indication for peripheral vascular disease. And I'm stunned why such an interesting drug, which is PAR1 uh, inhibitor, Varac Varaxapaxar, Varapaxar, the name of it is Zontiviti, uh, is not marketed. It's like dead compared to the other guys who were not that uh, good. I mean, the drugs. But what is important, the data are real. Nobody, you know, play with the data, with the outcomes in this trial. And look very carefully. Gasta moderate or severe bleeding, which is a real, real bleeding. It's not plata classification of bleeding. That's a heavy, heavy bleeding. If you bleed, you have way three, four times less events compared to, you know, if you bleed, you have more events than if you don't bleed. So realistically, saying that, oh, you bleed, that's why you wouldn't have any events, wrong. That's absolutely wrong. The more you bleed, the more chance for you to die or develop various, you know, vascular thrombotic events. That is a crystal clear signal which is sent for us by the TRA2P data. Next one. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh-huh. 
So the hint from the FDA is related, you would be surprised, to the Jupiter trial somehow too. So if you take secondary prevention situation after the acute vascular event, mostly acute coronary syndrome, documented acute coronary syndromes, overall, mortality in such patients will be 3 to 4%. If you have second myocardial infarction, meaning after the index event, the mortality bill will be between six and seven and a half percent. If you have any bleeding event, there is a chance to die one in 10, which is 10%. Related to the Jupiter, a look at the death rate in Jupiter, which is primary prevention trial, which were 60 plus healthy patients with no hypertension even, there is over 3% of death. Final thought, that's way too high, meaning that rate, uh, like COVID trial was at the same time, that's like secondary prevention, 3 plus percent of death. And here we have primary prevention, earlier, younger patients, not even like healthy. Some of them are healthy. Three point plus percent death. Final word on Jupiter for you, just to consider, because that trial is extremely important for you. Two words. A, that benefit was never repeated anymore for primary prevention mortality benefit. So as in Plata, the mortality benefit was never repeated in any other Tychagula trial, which were plenty. A, B, when the sponsor submitted the data on Jupiter, they submitted it to the um, metabolic union of FDA, not cardiorenal, which I have a privilege to work with. And guess what? They don't even look at the data. They never go to sites. They never check what's happened. What is the reason for this patient to die? What is happening? Where the right patients enrolled in the trial? We have no clue what happened there because the FDA somehow operated only with the evidence which was submitted by the sponsor. Just for, for your thoughts. Next, please. So in reality, bleeding caused three to four times more vascular thrombotic events, including extra deaths, challenging that comfort zone concept. So you have a bleeding, you have more chance to have a vascular death, dot, period. So we are going towards the aspirin story, which is the more aggressive antiplatelet strategies are really scary, especially long-term. Why is the aspirin in such a danger right now? There is a very simple reason. Triple therapy is too much. Everybody understands it. However, there is a huge marketing effort of P2Y12 inhibitor antiplatelet agent and Nivelle anticoagulant. So there is no spot for aspirin. This is how the big pharma think. That's why they're trying to kick aspirin out of the equation. In reality, the data on aspirin is so huge. And the benefit is there. It is a small benefit. It's not remarkable, huge benefit as we see in the PLATA trial. No, but the benefit is there. Next slide. So a few words very fast about non-compliance. It's in double digits. There is no question about it that there are many patients who don't, do not want to be very aggressive and disappoint their physician, but in reality, they didn't take the drug. And this goes with a, a major classes of uh, cardiovascular and metabolic drugs. Next one, please. This is related to antiplatelet agents as well. Not clear what's going on with uh, uh, anticoagulants. Next one, please. 
Next slide, please. Uh-huh. We could be the girl also, you know, also double digit, at least a quarter of the patients do not take it. And why? That's a very simple reason, because we are cheated on with regard to the realistic bleeding risks. With aspirin, I'm not even talking about the dose because this is very tricky. But with aspirin, you have about 5 to 7%, and ladies, about 7 to bleed. Yes, in Plavix, clopidogrel, 10% overall in ladies, about 12, 12 and a half. It's not two. It's not three, as the company are telling us. It's way more. And we have evidence uh, in the FIRES database with, uh, with all the antiplatelet agents, and you can see that bleeding is one of the most important and most frequent situations with regard to these agents. And it's way higher than, uh, you know, industry are trying us to believe. Next one. So anticoagulants, yes. Also, people are not taking them, putting them in real risk. Because if they stop taking, they will top, stop taking all three. They'll stop taking aspirin, Pitoid 12 inhibitor, and anticoagulant. Next one. Uh -huh. So we'll talk about um, aspirin. Next one. Uh, with regard to the trials on aspirin, we need to realize a few things. Thing number one is related to the fact that Aspirin is probably one of the hugest drugs which actually underwent clinical trials. The issues with these trials is threefold. First, they are designed differently. There are different doses. And third of all, uh, mentality. If I design a trial, I already see something which will be the end of that trial. And you cannot fight with it. And realistically, every principal investigator thinks he knows what will happen in his trial. And we cannot remove this uh, message from the pile of evidence with aspirin because since industry are not really supporting that much of these trials, my feeling, my gut hopes, my thoughts I think I'm the smartest person in the world with regard to research. That speaks for itself. And sometimes, and we see it left and right, the data are massaged towards my primary idea and primary objective. And that will not be eliminated until we change the humanity. That is the case. However, there is a couple very important things with regard to aspirin. Is aspirin preventing secondary events? Yes. The benefit is tiny, but it is real. It is there. Would the low-dose aspirin, like 81 milligram, prevent this? Answer is yes, it will. Would 81 milligram aspirin cause less bleeding than 325? Answer is yes. And these three yeses, are absolutely critical with regard to future development of aspirin. Next. Next slide, please. Uh-huh. So, so there are a, a bunch of meta-analysis going in every year, but, but I am very scared of meta-analysis. As my grandmother say, if you are doing a soup, you need to put very good quality products. Because if you put some junk there, you will receive junk. And therefore, combining everything, 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 like with, like with antiplatelet trials, meta-analysis, usually FDA are very skeptical and they don't even look at the data because some people put forced, actually, to put some junk within this meta-analysis. Next one. That is the little benefit of low-dose aspirin, and that is critical. Do not expect any miracles. Do not any expect any primary prevention with resuvastatin. Just be realistic. In this case, 81 milligram aspirin 
if you choose a tablet, which is important, if you do not coat it really, then you are golden. You do have a small benefit. With regard to primary prevention, not clear. Some evidence suggests yes, some no. What with regard to cancer? Not clear. There are two trials are going on and, you know, it takes time to figure out the results of those. But, uh, but irrelevant. It is definitely not increasing cancer of the other antiplatelet regimens. Next one. Next one. So, so with regard to guidelines, you know, guys, uh, we we all are forced sort of uh, to use this type of guidelines. But I advise you to be very careful with such recommendations, because with re for instance, uh, going on towards the antiplatelet agents. The top guys who do the recommendations on Ticagrelo are the guys who actually run the Ticagrelo trials. That is a very, very tricky situation. And I would be very cautious when applying to my patients, especially very aggressive uh, recommendations where people are suggesting some uh, extreme action. Be cautious and you will be way more safe than the others who are too brave and too fighty. Next one. So with regard to clinical consequences, yes. Venus thing, yes. Arterial thing, yes. Colon cancer, probably. And then brain situation, very hard to prove, probably. Next one. Uh, that is a very important slide suggesting that even low-dose aspirin cause remarkable, almost complete inhibition of uh, arachidonic acid-induced platelet aggregation. If that is true, and that is really true, so then why you need a high dose of aspirin is kind of questionable. If we know that low-dose aspirin cause less bleeding, but still provide vascular benefit, there is no reason to use the higher dose of aspirin. Next. Uh, next, there is a reduction of, uh, you know, bleeding if you use low-dose aspirin, and we show it with Eric Topol and big boys uh, back 20 years ago. Next one. Diabetes and everything else is uh, kind of for sure the target for future aspirin use. Uh, very unclear, very unclear uh, with regard to timing of benefit. Not sure diabetes are different. There are so many illusions and myths about diabetes that it is like getting into equation aspirin is is very challenging, I would say. But... In case of the dose of aspirin, clear cut, low dose aspirin cause less bleeding. Nothing further, Your Honor. That's it. Done with this part. Next one. So aspirin here is like the little girl in the middle of this picture. You see, there is like antiplatelet agent saying, oh, I will, we are with you. And then there is another girl who is like anticoagulants, but they love each other, but try to <laughs> left aspirin untouched. In reality, aspirin is there to stay. Any effort to remove aspirin from the uh, protective cocktail will fail miserably because you cannot get rid of the evidence which we have on aspirin. And therefore, I thank you for your attention and will be very, very happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Victor. Anyone have a question? Yeah, yeah, Sela. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Victor. If you had done so well, any question? Any question? That's okay. Thank you, Fisoa. Uh,
Uh, okay, thank you, Professor, for this uh, nice lecture. Uh, just I want to know, finally, uh, for primary prevention, you recommend aspirin or no? I do After not After the know. last slide you present to us. <laughs> I do not know the results. And anybody who will tell you he knows precisely the result will lie. I do not know and I doubt there is enough evidence. I would say it this way. The risks of low dose aspirin for primary prevention are extremely low. And if the patient does not experience any hemorrhagic events, I would probably do it, especially in those with a high risk, such as diabetics. The answer is yes, although the evidence is not conclusive. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you so much, Dr. Victor, for the interesting lecture. And uh, hope to see you soon. And uh, yeah. And I think we're uh, going to do the closing right now. <laughs> okay. Think about Jupiter, friends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.